Well, Timothy, Steve, and Anthony, thank you very much for your introduction. It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to London and to the city of London, my city. London, a city of 8 million people. The city of London, a city of 8,000 people. And what a great privilege for a city of 8,000 people to get a world conference. It's not easy, you know, to get the CTBUH conference. You have to go through an initiation process that lasts for years. And Anthony has sort of hinted at this in his introduction by saying that we've spent quite a bit of time together over the last few years. And this was all part of a testing process to see whether we should be allowed to have a conference in London, and in particular in the city of London. First of all, I was invited to go and speak at a conference in Chicago. This wasn't a world conference, this was a, a tri trial run. Uh, and I, I turned up with a very heavy cold, thinking this might get me out of speaking. Not a bit of it. They produced a bar stool, they put it on the stage, they sat me down and they said, now do your talk. So, we passed that test. The next one, they said, right, we're going to try you in a world conference, uh, Dubai. Okay, well, I hadn't been to Dubai. I said, what's the topic? They said, sustainability. And I said, now run that past me again, Dubai and sustainability. And they said, yes. I said, well, okay, I'm up for challenges, because I assume that's what it was. Uh, I came out of the airport in Dubai, and I found them trying to air condition an outdoor taxi rank. And I had to talk about sustainability. Well, I must have passed that test, because the next thing I knew was that I was being invited to go on maneuvers with Anthony to Finland, to Helsinki. And this was obviously the practical part of the test. And this involved two things that were very memorable for me. On one day, we had to have two lunches with two different mayors, one in Helsinki and one in Espoo, immediately next to Helsinki. But we weren't allowed to tell either mayor that we were seeing the other mayor. So that was quite an interesting diplomatic challenge. Uh, and then following that, um, we were roped in, literally, to testing Kearney's new high-speed lifts in a limestone mine in the middle of Finland. Uh, and we passed that practical test too, and what's more, we survived. So here we are, London has got the conference, and as we've heard in the introduction, one of the downsides of having a conference in London, to some people, especially people from countries with sunshine, is that you can't predict the weather. Well, you can. I always have one piece of advice for people from other countries who come to London. If you want to know what weather you're going to have today, watch tomorrow's weather forecast. That will always work. And I've been trying to get you an image of London and the city in the sunshine to show you just how wonderful the new tall buildings are that we're building. And, um, well, we did our best. That's sometimes how planning seems. It's sometimes uh, a little obscure to people that are coming to a city for the first time. They can see the tip of the problem, but they can't see the fundamental issues. The City of London is a world business centre with 2,000 years of trading history. This was the highest point up the River Thames that the Romans could reach when they arrived here. And they brought with them a new form of organisation. They created London and the world's business district 2,000 years ago. And we've adapted and changed that business district ever since. Now, the, the arrival of the Romans was a very lucky break for London. In those days, the people who lived in the United Kingdom were the indigenous people, the Celts, people like me, the equivalent of the Native American Indians, the indigenous people who had come in after the Ice Age. But we were lucky because from the Roman period on, the English started to arrive, um, a nation of immigrants, Romans, Vikings, Saxons, Normans, Bangladeshis, Kurds, you name it, the English have every race on the planet within them. Uh, I always find it very amusing that some English people complain about immigration. <laughs> I mean, England is composed of immigration, that's what it is. And we Celts have never objected, so I don't really see why the English should. Now you might say, well, what's the advantage to this, of having a, a country full of immigrants? Well, the advantage is that it allows a city like London to be a true world city. There are over 300 languages spoken by school children in London every day. That's incredibly sustainable. 
That's a city that belongs to the world, not to the English, not to the British, to the world. It takes, well, here's some advice for the delegates. It only takes three weeks to become a Londoner. The first two weeks, you're on vacation. On the third week, if you say you're a Londoner, it doesn't matter what the color of your skin, your language, your cultural background, nobody will challenge you. You will be a Londoner. There are very few cities in the world where you can say that is equally true. New York is a possible um, parallel where you can become a New Yorker very quickly. Now, try to become a Parisian. I'm sorry if your great-grandparents weren't born in Paris, you will never be accepted as a Parisian, not even if you're from one of the suburbs. Monocultural or bicultural cities have great difficulties in becoming centers of world trade because most of the people trading there will feel as if they are foreigners. So London is building on this great advantage of 2,000 years of trading history and 2,000 years of being a cosmopolitan world city. The other thing I've already alluded to, which is very sustainable about London, is our climate. The more global warming increases, the more our weather stays the same. Nothing seems to change. The clouds roll in, the clouds roll out, the sun comes through. Then we have some wind, then we have some rain. There's always a variety. You're always going to be surprised, whether you bring an umbrella, whether you bring a raincoat, whether you bring your sun clothes, you're going to get it wrong, and you're going to get it right. So that's a, a sustainable advantage. We never have the real extremes of cold or the real extremes of heat that use vast amounts of energy. And the other thing, and the other third test of sustainability, is connectedness. London is very well connected, which is proved by the range of places that you have all come from. It's connected in so many ways, but it's also especially well connected internally. It has a very good public transport system. We Londoners, we always moan about the underground and about the buses and about the delays. But I always find when people come from other countries, they're amazed how good and how varied our public transport is. And that's why in this very strange city of London, which I have the privilege to plan, Although we only have 8,000 residents, we have 380,000 people who work here every day in this business district. And of that 380,000 people, over 90% come to work by public transport. Another 7% walk or cycle. So it's now well below 5% of our workers who are coming to work by car. That produces a very sustainable building, place. I said building. I meant place, because I was thinking about sustainable buildings. And people always say to me, how can we make our buildings more sustainable? And I always say, well, the first thing is build them in a sustainable place. Because if you don't build your building in a sustainable place, you're wasting your time. If you build a, an ultra-sustainable building in a city where people arrive by car, you've removed all of the benefit that you'd achieved with the design of the building. So first choose a sustainable location, and then you have a chance of creating a sustainable building. It's the travel patterns of the things which predict most about the energy that that building and the people who occupy it consume. So London is a very sustainable place, and as a result of its 2,000 years of history, as a result of its cosmopolitan status and its sustainability, people seem to want to invest here. Now, I often want to say London is the best place in the world to invest in property. But I usually turn that round and say London is the least worst place in the world to invest in property. Because, as we all know, investment is an uncertain process. When you look at uh, a city with this sort of history and look at the amount of inward investment, it makes you think that London maybe is, in fact, offering something that is of attraction to the rest of the world. We have money coming from American pension funds, some of it being taken out of New York to be invested in property in London. We have large amounts of money coming from sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East and from high net worth individuals in Russia and China. Money coming from all over the world from areas where there is, is perhaps less certainty for investment and wanting a slice of London. A lot of that money wanting existing buildings full of tenants, understandably, because they want security for their money but a considerable amount of money coming into new projects in London. The City of London has a vacancy rate of now around about 7%. That's below what is healthy. 
8% we regard as the minimum healthy vacancy rate, and we've dropped below that. So we're short of space in the City of London. We're finding new occupiers moving into the City of London from the West End. Um, people like uh, Amazon have announced moving it, they're moving into the city. Bloomberg are building their European headquarters in the heart of the city. We find firms of headhunters moving from the West End who traditionally didn't look at the city. The insurance sector in the eastern part of the city is booming dramatically with Aon moving their headquarters from Chicago to the city of London, W.R. Barclay building their own skyscraper in the city. All of this indicating that the city is becoming a more rounded place in business terms, which is good, and that we're moving away from what has been a very strange 25-year period following deregulation of financial services, the Big Bang, when the city has been dominated by banks. Historically, the city was always about business first and finance second. Finance was simply there to support business activity. And it appears that that's now beginning to return, and I think that's very healthy. And especially in the property market, it's healthy to see that most property projects are now funded by real estate money, not by bank money. Uh, if you want a disaster, get a bank involved in property. Well, if you want a disaster, get a bank involved in anything, I suppose you could say. But especially property. I remember even in the 1980s, the late 80s, when we could see the boom happening after financial deregulation, offering the advice that you should never trust a developer with money or a bank with property. If money is too easy, developers will build too much and there'll be a crash. If banks get involved in property, well, we all know what happens next. So the real estate money that's coming to London is good news because it's coming for the long term. It's coming for security of capital rather than for rapid high profit, which is what the banks were in it for. Having painted this picture of a city that's bursting at the seams with demand and where we have 2,000 years of history, you won't be surprised to hear that we found it somewhat difficult to expand. Our boundaries are very tight. Although we're the historic centre of London, London has grown up around us and constrains the further growth of the business district. There are other alternatives in London, in the West End. In the 1980s, we built London's second Croydon at Canary Wharf. And uh, that has helped for a while. We couldn't have managed through the 1990s without Canary Wharf. We needed that satellite expansion space. But a world city cannot exist on satellites, as La Défense proves. You have to have downtown business activity. It's the downtown that keeps the city alive. It's the downtown that attracts people from around the world to bring their businesses. It's not worth crossing the planet to find yourself on the edge of a city. Why would you? You can be on the edge of any city because they're all the same. But if you can find a place in downtown, you can latch into the way that that city works and that city's traditions. And in the city of London, our greatest tradition is the tradition of gossip. All the pubs and the restaurants and little alleyways of the city are full of people at lunchtimes and at various times during the day walking from one meeting to another because the city is small enough to allow you to walk between meetings. And people bump into each other on those visits between buildings, people they weren't expecting to meet. Or else, at lunchtime, they might go into a pub or into a restaurant and overhear somebody else's conversation or gossip with friends. That's all information that never appears on the internet. That's all information that doesn't pass electronically. That's the stuff you only get when you eyeball somebody or, better still, in an English pub, back towards their conversation group and, and eavesdrop on what they're saying. And all that information is worth a lot of money. That's the information that people take back to their offices to make money. An analogy I often use for the City of London is that it's like a collection of beehives on a compost heap. The beehives are our new towers, which house the bankers. We're a bit like the drones, like the bees, making honey. And the compost heap is where all the interesting flowers grow, the place where the bankers go at lunchtime to find nectar, which they find in the pubs and restaurants. Of course, while they're gathering that nectar, without realizing it, they're picking up the pollen, which is the gossip. And it's that pollen that they take back, first of all, between the flowers and then back to the beehive. That's where the business is fueled. That's where the business is made in those centers of gossip. 
So if we're going to build beehives, which we have, and there you, you saw earlier a few of those beehives poking through the clouds, if we're going to build beehives in the city to accommodate people who need space, then we have to do it very carefully. Because the important thing is, is what already exists. It's the gossip networks of the City of London. And what we don't want to do is to damage those. Because without them, if we were to clear those areas away to construct tall buildings, we would just be like any other out-of-town business park. The cluster of towers that we've created in the city around the Gherkin are in the eastern part of the city because that's the side of the city that is out of the protected views of St. Paul's Cathedral. People find it very difficult to understand the planning system in the UK because we don't tell you what you can do. If you go to New York, you can have an as-of-rights building by following the code. You can do this in many parts of the world. In Germany, if you're prepared to wait 10 years, they will produce a master plan for you, and then you're able to develop. And that's why Frankfurt has been so successful. Um, back in the 1980s, Frankfurt was a quiet market town, whereas now, of course, it's a quiet market town with skyscrapers. Uh, they thought that building tall buildings and master planning, a strategy for building tall buildings, would produce a world financial center. Well, it didn't. Uh, and the reason was, of course, that they didn't have the interest there to begin with. They didn't have the gossip channels. Everybody in Frankfurt gets into their car at 4.30 in the afternoon and drives into the townless hills to the little villages where they live. The city is dead at night. You need to have life. You need to have something to attract people in the first place. If you wouldn't consider going to a city for a weekend vacation, then why would you consider moving your business there? It's not going to be any more interesting. So in the city of London, we don't have a set of rules telling you what you can do. And I don't believe that that sort of system produces a flexible place that can adapt to changing circumstances. What we have instead is a set of rules telling you what you can't do. The places where you can't build to obstruct views of St. Paul's Cathedral, the maximum height that you can build in order that you don't obstruct the aircraft flying into city airport. All of these things come together to form a set of constraints. But after you've set those very basic constraints, then there's great flexibility for developers and their funders and architects to use their ingenuity to find the best solution to the site. People assume that we set out to build an iconic building when the Gherkin was produced. Not at all. It's simply a reaction to planning constraints and the site itself. It's designed to be kind to the microclimate in its shape. It's designed to maximize the amount of open space at the base of the building. It's de designed to diminish the impact of the height of the building by setting back at the top. And those of you that visited it last night will know what, just what an exciting building it is when you're inside as well as when on the outside. But a lot of people assume that we'd produced an unusual shape just to be different, to produce an icon. Well, you can't design an icon. A lot of people have tried, and everybody has failed. An icon, by its definition, is a third-rate Russian painting, which has acquired religious significance. The artist didn't give it the religious significance. The artist just painted a run-of-the-mill painting to stick in a church. But the people who worshipped in the church came to like it, and they made it into an icon. Exactly the same with the buildings. It wasn't the architect who produced an icon at the Gherkin. It was the public who produced the icon by adopting it and giving it the nickname. And then saying, where's the next one? What shape is it? And what is its nickname? Because they'd fallen back into love with tall buildings, having seen the interesting Gherkin as the first of the new breed of tall buildings in the city. So then... I had to think very quickly of the name Cheese Grater, and the reason I called the Richard Rogers building the Cheese Grater was because Lord Rogers' wife, Ruth Rogers, runs a very fine Italian restaurant called River Cafe, and I could imagine her using one of those for the Parmigiano Reggiano to grate the cheese onto the pasta. The press then very helpfully came along with Walkie Talkie, and the rest, as they say, is history. But that nickname, nicknaming was very important. London, being a historic city, was not a place that was used to tall buildings. And the few tall buildings that we'd had were, by and large, not of very high architectural quality. The buildings of the 60s and 70s had been built cheaply, quickly, and with little thought for their particular locality. We had to change that. And as I say, the fact that the buildings have acquired nicknames indicates to me that 
indeed that has been the case and that people have now accepted tall buildings in our heritage. So ad adapting your buildings to the place is very important. Not taking something somebody else has done and sticking it into your city. Not deliberately designing a wacky building in the hope that it will make you famous. Not designing the world's tallest building in the hope that that will make you famous. There's nothing worse than having the world's second tallest building, as many cities around the world can bear testimony. We've never tried to build the world's tallest building in London. We wouldn't wish to do so. If you build wacky, if you build ultra-tall, then all you're going to do is create boredom for the few months on after people have got used to whatever you've created. If you build well with buildings that are in context in your area, then there's a chance that it will actually continue the success you already have. Don't build tall to change your fortunes. Build tall because you're already successful and you've run out of space. And if that's true, then do it well. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to London. <laughs>